Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary, our first episode of 2024 to kick things off. Today we're going to be looking at gingival recession and orthodontics. This was a lecture given by James Andrews. and I'm more than happy to declare my conflict of interest with James as he's a contributor to the Orthodontics in Summary blog. It comes down to the health and aesthetics of the periodontium. This occupied a greater interest, both clinicians and patient, the so-called pink aesthetics. And the driver for this really has been, in orthodontic terms, the increase in adults seeking orthodontic treatment. It's increased by 800% since the late 1970s. But what is the starting point of adults when it comes to their periodontal health? Well, actually, 50% of them already have some elements of periodontal disease. An equal amount have actually have dehiscences present. And 37% have fenestrations. This is Evangelista's paper from 2010. Now, the facial type also makes a significant difference to patients' experience of periodontal disease and their bone loss. In Tunis's paper from 2021, they looked at dolicocephalic patients who had increased vertical growth, but actually a thinner alveolus, almost a compensatory mechanism for the direction of vertical growth pattern. However, the brachiocephalic patients had a larger, thicker alveolus. James labelled the dolicocephalic patient as the red flag patients when it came to orthodontic tooth movement. So which tooth movement are we the most concerned of? Well, it's the facial movement, that labial movement that occupies the greatest concern. As the tooth approaches the buccal bone, there's a reduction in the buccal lingual width. And therefore, there's a reduction in the free gingival present. It affects bone and soft tissue. And this, but this problem can only occur if the tooth is positioned outside of the alveolar housing. So what type of movement are we looking for more specifically? Well, Kondo showed in 2017, when comparing both bodily movement and tipping movement, it was a tipping movement that seemed to result in the greatest gingival recession. So how do we decide what to do? Well, we can use the WALA line, the Will Andrews and Larry Andrews Ridge, which was established in 2000. This demarcates where the label bone lies and is coincident with the mucogingival junction. And it's a wonderful theory that was put forward. It now has been evidenced by Gloss's 2019 paper, which used a CBCT to confirm, indeed, the WALA Ridge line is an appropriate position to aim for our arch forms. It's important to know the position of teeth where they occur naturally as well. For example, the upper incisors are located a third from the label alveolus, whereas the mandibular incisors are centered within the middle of the alveolus. So does that mean for every inclination we procline teeth, we're going to have recession? I'm afraid not. It is not conclusive as to the relationship between proclination and the amount of recession which occurs. However, the thickness of the gingiva is a key determinant. And where there is, from Yarrow's 2006 study, a gingiva which is more than 0.5 millimetres thick, the patient is less likely to get recession. However, less than 0.5 millimetres, the chance of recession are significantly increased for those patients. James was full of quotations from the legends in orthodontics. He quoted Lyle Johnson and mentioning, not every case deserves to be treated non-extraction. What about appliance type? If we use aligners, are we less likely to get recession and bone loss occurring? Well, not the case. As has been shown in Spirito's 2023 systematic review, there is no clinical difference between both aligner outcomes and fixed appliance outcomes when it comes to bone loss, recession and dehiscences. However, those studies were short term and medium term. And we still wait to see the long term evidence of what comes out. Can we correct teeth if they're positioned extra alveolar? It was a really interesting study that was carried out by the legend Bjorn Zacherson. They took some monkeys and they positioned the teeth outside of the alveolus for eight months. They created fenestrations and dehiscences. They then repositioned those teeth back into the alveolus and the def defect in the bone was resolved. In a clinical sense, no better than Morton Larson and Beata Melson looked at 12 patients who had bone loss and recession and carried out orthodontic treatment to bring the teeth back into the alveolus. Once centered, what they found was remarkable. There was an increase in the depth of the gingiva, but also in the width by 38%. Intrusion is a tool to improve the periodontal outcomes for patients. 
Birte Melson, again, we thank her for this, in the late 1980s, showed an increase through intrusive movements of incisors of 0.7 to 2.3 millimeters of the periodontal tissues. When it comes to carrying out grafting, we need to wait a period of time before moving teeth into it. For free gingival grafts, it's six weeks, and for connective tissue grafts, it is 12 weeks. And the final quotation from James Andrews was that of Peck from 2017, that we should diagnose and treat each tooth, and there are no shortcuts to good orthodontics. As always, please do subscribe and look forward to our next episode.